This is Space Time Series 24, Episode 63. Coming up on Space Time, a new study suggests the Jovian ice moon Europa could have undersea volcanoes. NASA launches a high altitude plasma experiment. And the US Space Force takes over the Vandenberg Air Force Base. All that and more coming up on Space Time. Welcome to Space Time with Stuart Gary. New research shows volcanic activity may have occurred on the seafloor of Jupiter's ice moon Europa in the recent past and may still be happening today. Scientists have strong evidence that Europa harbors an enormous global subsurface ocean beneath kilometers of thick icy crust. The new findings, reported in the journal Geophysical Research Letters, shows how the moon may have enough internal heat to partially melt this rocky layer a process that could feed volcanoes on the ocean floor. The new three-dimensional computer modelling of how this internal heat is produced and transferred is the most detailed examination yet of the effect of this internal heating on the Moon. The key to Europa's rocky mantle being hot enough to melt lies with the massive gravitational pull Jupiter has on its moons. As Europa orbits around the gas giant, huge gravitational tidal forces generated by the massive planet causes the tiny moon to literally flex, stretching and compressing as it orbits this, the largest planet in the solar system. All this flexing generates lots of heat in the moon's interior, enough heat to melt water ice, giving Europa its subsurface oceans, and maybe even enough heat to melt rocks as well. The research shows where this heat dissipates and how it melts Europa's rocky mantle, increasing the likelihood of volcanoes on the seafloor. Volcanic activity deep under Europa's icy crust has been a topic of speculation for astronomers for decades. The new studies predicted the volcanic activity most likely occurs near Europa's poles, the latitudes where the most heat's generated. Now, if they exist, these underwater volcanoes could be powering a hydrothermal system just like that which fuels life at the bottom of Earth's oceans. On Earth, when the seawater comes into contact with hot magma at the mid-ocean ridges, the interaction results in chemical energy. And it's this chemical energy from the hydrothermal systems, rather than sunlight from the surface, which helps support life deep in Earth's oceans. Volcanic activity on Europa's seafloor would therefore be one way to support a potential habitable environment in that moon's oceans. The new findings come as NASA continues its preparations for its upcoming Europa Clipper mission, which is targeting a 2024 launch date and a 2030 arrival time at Europa. Europa Clipper will orbit Jupiter and perform dozens of flybys of Europa, mapping the Moon and investigating its composition. Among the science data it collects, the spacecraft will survey the surface in detail and sample the Moon's thin atmosphere. The surface and atmospheric observations will give scientists the chance to learn more about the Moon's interior ocean if the ocean water percolates up through the icy crust. The Saturnian ice moon Enceladus also generates powerful geysers from its south pole tiger stripes. These eruptions are constantly spewing water ice and possibly salts far into space. Scientists believe the exchange of material between the ocean and the crust would leave traces of the seawater on the surface. They also believe the exchange may emit gases and possibly even plumes of water vapour with ejected particles that could contain materials coming from the seafloor. As Europa Clipper measures the Moon's gravity and magnetic field, anomalies in those areas, especially towards the poles, could help confirm the volcanic activity predicted by the new research. This is Space Time. Still to come, NASA launches a high-altitude plasma experiment and the Vandenberg Air Force Base gets a new name. All that and more still to come on Space Time. Okay, let's take a break from our show now for a word from our sponsor, NordVPN. You know, protecting your data and enjoying the internet without restrictions is something we all crave. No big tech companies telling you what to do, no hackers or government agencies spying on your every move, which, let's face it, that's pretty creepy. 
The answer involves using a good virtual private network service. And that's where NordVPN comes in. It gives you complete anonymity online, protecting you from snoopers and hackers. And you can use it on any device, including your mobile, tablets, laptops or desktop computers. With NordVPN, you can bypass censorship filters and you get access to websites that are geo-blocked. By using NordVPN, you'll be able to stream videos without buffering both at home and abroad. And NordVPN lets you enjoy unlimited bandwidth for all your devices so you don't have to worry about running out of data again. NordVPN lets you protect yourself from cyber attacks by encrypting sensitive information like banking passwords and credit card numbers. That means hackers won't be able to see what's inside your messages if they're intercepted. In fact, NordVPN is simply the world's best virtual private network service. You really need NordVPN. And to help you get started, we have a special offer for you through SpaceTime. Just go to nordvpn.com slash stuartgarry or use the coupon code stuartgarry to get a two-year plan plus one additional month at a huge discount. That URL again is nordvpn.com slash stuartgarry or use the coupon code stuartgarry at the checkout. And you'll find the URL details in the show notes and on the SpaceTime website. That's nordvpn.com slash stuartgarry. And now, it's back to our show. This is Space Time with Stuart Gary. NASA has launched a sounding rocket on a mission to better understand the interaction between charged particles from the Sun and those in near-Earth space. The four-stage Black Brant 12 suborbital flight was launched from NASA's Wallops Island Flight Facility on the Virginia Mid-Atlantic coast, flying on a broad arc into the ionosphere over the Atlantic Ocean and then descending near Bermuda. The mission came on the final day of a 10-day launch window, which had been plagued by bad weather and high-altitude winds. The mission payload was the University of Alaska Fairbanks Kinetic Scale Energy Momentum Transport Experiment. It's designed to study how plasma energy and momentum are transported between different regions of space which are magnetically connected. Principal investigator Peter Delamere says the Aurora Australis and Aurora Borealis, the southern and northern lights, are formed when ionized particles from the sun flowing in the solar wind and coronal mass ejections are captured by Earth's magnetosphere and transported down magnetic field lines into Earth's atmosphere where they collide with atoms and molecules releasing photons and putting on their spectacular light displays. Delamere says that electrons in Earth's local space environment and in the solar wind have relatively low energies, but the aurora are generated by very high-energy electrons, and he wants to understand this energization mechanism. Another example of energy momentum transport is the interaction between Io's atmosphere and Jupiter's local space environment, which leads to an Io-induced auroral spot in Jupiter's atmosphere. Astronomers know the power generated by Io's interaction and the auroral power from the spot. But they don't know how the energy and momentum are transported along the connecting magnetic field lines between the two. To try to work this out, the kinetics experiment saw the high-altitude release of two canisters of barium thermite producing purple and green plasma clouds. These plasma clouds then generated their own electromagnetic fields and waves, which then interacted with the existing plasma in Earth's ionosphere. This is space time. Still to come, the Vandenberg Air Force Base gets a new name, and the June Solstice, the constellation Virgo, and the Torrid's meteor shower are among the highlights of the June night skies on Skywatch. All that and much more still to come on space time. The Vandenberg Air Force Base in California has been renamed the Vandenberg Space Force Base. The name change took place at a special ceremony in the parade grounds of the sprawling facility, 230 kilometers north of Los Angeles. Vandenberg is used for ballistic missile and orbital rocket launches, and was also being equipped to launch space shuttles from the West Coast. Its geographical location made it ideal for launches into polar orbits. Vandenberg's host unit, the 30th Space Wing, has been renamed Space Launch Delta under the new Space Operations Command. 
The United States Space Force was created as the sixth uniform military branch in 2019 by U.S. President Donald Trump. Personnel formerly assigned to the Air Force Space Command have been reassigned to the Space Force. Vandenberg was originally established back in 1941 during the Second World War as Camp Cook, a U.S. Army garrison for tank infantry and artillery training. This is Space Time. And time now to check out the night skies of June on Skywatch. June is the fourth month of the old Roman calendar and is named after Juno, who was the wife of Jupiter and also the equivalent to the Greek goddess Hera. Another belief is that the month's name actually comes from the Latin word unores, which means younger ones. June is a great time to look up at the night skies and marvel at the majesty of the Milky Way, which puts on a spectacular overhead display this time of year. And of course, June also marks the June solstice, which this year happens at 13.32 Australian Eastern Standard Time on the afternoon of Monday, June the 21st. That's 23.32 on the night of Sunday, June the 20th, US Eastern Daylight Time, and 3.32 in the morning, June the 21st, Greenwich Mean Time. Here in the Southern Hemisphere, it's the time of the winter solstice. And of course, it means the arrival of summer for our lucky listeners north of the equator. The June solstice occurs when the sun reaches its most northerly point in the sky as seen from Earth, zenith appearing to be directly over the Tropic of Cancer. Contrary to popular belief that the seasons on Earth occur when the Earth's orbit around the sun is at its nearest or furthest points, they're actually governed by the tilt of Earth's axis as it journeys around the sun in a year. So on the day of the June solstice, the Earth's south pole is tilted by 23.5 degrees away from the sun, The sun rises north of east and sets north of west. Six months later, when the South Pole is tilted towards the sun, it's the Southern Hemisphere summer. And in between, we have the autumn and spring equinoxes. Almost overhead this time of year, we have the constellation Virgo. The constellation is named after Virgo, the goddess of justice and the harvest in ancient Greek mythology, who used her scales to weigh good and evil. However, she became so disenchanted with the evil deeds of men, she threw away her scales and retreated to the heavens. Interestingly, the ancient Egyptians also associated Virgo with agriculture. There, she was the goddess Isis, who sprinkled the heads of wheat across the sky, forming the Milky Way. To science, Virgo is a tightly packed region of space containing some 2,000 galaxies, all gravitationally bound into a gigantic galaxy cluster located some 60 million light years away, of which our local group of galaxies is simply an outlying member. A light year is 10 trillion kilometres, the distance a photon can travel in a year at the speed of light, which is about 300,000 kilometres per second in a vacuum, and the ultimate speed limit of the universe. The mass of the Virgo supercluster is so enormous that its gravity generates the so-called Virgo-centric flow, causing our Milky Way galaxy, as well as Andromeda and all the other members of our local group, to move towards the supercluster at around 400 kilometers per second. That's despite the accelerated expansion of the universe over cosmic timescales. The Virgo supercluster is now thought to be nothing more than a lobe of an even bigger galaxy supercluster known as Laniakea, the centre of which is known as the Great Attractor. Laniakea and the Great Attractor are among the largest known structures in the universe. Despite the Virgo cluster size, it's so far away, it's difficult to see without a decent-sized backyard telescope. You'll want something at least 100 millimetres in diameter or larger. Located right next to Virgo and directly overhead this time of year is the constellation Corvus the Crow. Greek mythology tells us Corvus could talk to humans, but he was a lazy bird. And so Apollo took away his ability to speak and banished him to the heavens. One of the highlights in the constellations Virgo and Corvus is the spectacular Sombrero Galaxy M104. Visible with a good pair of binoculars or a small telescope, this stunning spiral galaxy is seen almost edge on, providing a spectacular backlit view of its galactic bold stars and the molecular gas and dust lanes in its arms. M104 is located some 31 million light years away and is moving away from the Milky Way at about 1,000 kilometers per second. 
The Sombrero Galaxy has a diameter of about 50,000 light years. That's about 30% the size of our own galaxy, the Milky Way. It's surrounded by up to 2,000 globular clusters and an active central supermassive black hole at least a billion times the mass of our Sun. Now, by comparison, Sagittarius A star, that's the supermassive black hole at the centre of the Milky Way, has just 4.3 million times the mass of the Sun. Globular clusters are tight balls containing millions of stars, which were all either originally formed at the same time from the same collapsing molecular gas and dust cloud, or they're the surviving cores of small galaxies that have been cannibalized by larger ones. By the way, the brightest star in Virgo is Spica, a spectroscopic binary located some 250 light years away. Spectroscopic binaries are double star systems orbiting so close to each other or at such an angle that they can't be visually separated, at least not from our viewpoint on Earth. Under these conditions, their spectrum will actually be a combination of the spectra of both of the stars in the system. But as these stars orbit each other, one of the stars will be moving sort of towards us, the other will be moving sort of away from us. So, the star moving towards us will have a spectra that will be slightly blue shifted into high frequencies, shorter wavelengths, while the star moving away from us will have its spectra slightly red shifted to lower frequencies, longer wavelengths. And so, the two stars in the system can be separated by their Doppler shift. Looking about 20 degrees above the western horizon in the early evening is the fourth brightest celestial object in the sky, the dog star Sirius. Only the Sun, the Moon and the planet Venus look brighter. To the northwest or right of Sirius is another fairly bright star called Procyon, the brightest star in the constellation Canis Minor, the lesser dog. In Greek mythology, Canis Minor and Canis Major were Orion's hunting dogs. Procyon is a binary star system, comprising a spectral type F main sequence white star, Procyon A, and a faint white dwarf companion, Procyon B. Main sequence stars are those undergoing hydrogen fusion into helium in their cores. Astronomers describe stars in terms of spectral types, a classification system based on temperature and characteristics. The hottest, most massive, and most luminous stars are known as spectral type O blue stars. They're followed by spectral type B blue white stars, then spectral type A white stars, spectral type F whitish yellow stars, spectral type G yellow stars, that's where our sun fits in, spectral type K orange stars, and then the coolest and least massive of all stars are spectral type M red stars, commonly referred to as red dwarfs. Each spectral classification is also subdivided using a numeric digit to represent temperature, with zero being the hottest and nine the coolest, and a Roman numeral to represent luminosity. Now put all that together, and our Sun is officially classified as a G2V or G25 yellow dwarf star. Also included in the classification system are spectral types L, T and Y, which are assigned to failed stars known as brown dwarves, some of which were actually born as spectral type M red dwarf stars, but became brown dwarves after losing enough of their mass. Brown dwarves fit into a category between the largest planets, which are about 13 times the mass of Jupiter, and the smallest spectral type M red dwarf stars, which are around 75 to 80 times the mass of Jupiter, or 0.08 solar masses. The white dwarf Procyon b has about 0.6 times the mass of the Sun, and a diameter of about 8,600 kilometers. A white dwarf is the stellar corpse of a Sun-like star. Having used up its nuclear fuel supply, fusing hydrogen into helium in the main sequence, it then expands into a red giant and begins fusing helium into carbon and oxygen. Stars like our Sun aren't massive enough to fuse carbon and oxygen into heavier elements, and so they turn off. Their outer gaseous envelopes float off into space as spectacular objects called planetary nebula. What's left behind is a super-dense white-hot stellar core about the size of the Earth called a white dwarf, which will slowly cool over the eons of time. Located about 11.6 light years away, Procyon A has about one and a half times the mass of the Sun and about twice its radius. It also has about seven times the Sun's luminosity, making it unusually bright for a star of this type. And that suggests that it started to evolve off the main sequence after having fused nearly all of its core hydrogen into helium.
It means the star is about to expand into a subgiant as it begins fusing core helium into carbon and oxygen and burning hydrogen in its outer shell. As it continues to expand, the star will eventually swell to somewhere between 80 and 150 times its current diameter. It will then become a red giant. This will probably happen within the next 10 to 100 million years. The blink of an eye in astronomical terms. The two stars, Procyon A and B, orbit each other every 40.82 Earth years at an average distance of 15 astronomical units, about the distance of Uranus's orbit around the Sun. An astronomical unit is the average distance between the Earth and the Sun, which is about 150 million kilometres or 8.3 light minutes. Looking to the north-northwest now, and you'll see the constellation Leo the Lion, looking like a bunch of stars shaped like an upside-down question mark. Located just 36.7 light years away in the constellation Booties the Herdsman is Arcturus, a bloated, aging red giant, about 7.1 billion years old and nearing the end of its life. Having used up all its core hydrogen, it's now fusing helium into carbon and oxygen. That's caused the star, which is only slightly more massive than the Sun, to expand outwards to around 25 times the Sun's diameter and become about 170 times as luminous. It'll soon puff off its outer gaseous envelope as a planetary nebula, in the process revealing its white-hot stellar core. In Greek mythology, Arcturus was the guardian of the bear. Now this is a reference to being next to the constellations Ursa Major and Ursa Minor, the greater and lesser bears. There's some indications that Arcturus could have a binary stellar companion, but the results remain inconclusive, at least for now. There's also speculation that it could have a large planet or substellar object orbiting it, something about 12 Jupiter masses in size. But again, the research remains inconclusive. Looking to the east, and you'll see the three brightest stars in the constellation of Libra, the scales of justice, are visible about halfway, about 40 degrees, above the horizon. These also represent the claws of Scorpius the Scorpion, which is chasing Orion across the sky. The brightest star in the constellation Scorpius is Alpha Scorpi, or Antares, the scorpion's heart. Easily seen with the unaided eye, this red supergiant is some 550 light years away, and it's one of the largest known stars in the universe. Antares has about 18 times the mass and an incredible 883 times the diameter of the Sun. And it's about 10,000 times more luminous than our Sun, too. OK, turning to the southeast now, and there you'll see the constellation Sagittarius, the Archer. It's important because it marks the direction to the centre of our galaxy, the Milky Way. And of course, located some 27,000 light years away in that direction is the galaxy's central supermassive black hole, Sagittarius A star. To the ancient Babylonians, Sagittarius was the god Nurgle, the centaur, a creature half man and half horse. By the time Greek mythology took over, Sagittarius was carrying a bow loaded with an arrow and pointing directly towards Antares, the heart of Scorpius the Scorpion. The centre of the Milky Way and its supermassive black hole Sagittarius A star lie in the westernmost part of Sagittarius. The brightest star in Sagittarius is Epsilon Sagittarii, or Cors Australis, the southern part of the bow. Epsilon Sagittarius is a binary system located 143 light years away. The primary star is an evolved spectral type E blue giant at the end of its life on the main sequence. It is about three and a half times the sun's mass and about seven times its radius, and is radiating around 363 times the sun's luminosity. It's also a very strong X-ray source, and is spinning very rapidly, with an estimated radial velocity of some 236 kilometers per second. The system also displays an excess of infrared radiation emissions, suggesting the presence of a circumstellar disk of dust. Now, the second star in the system appears to be inside this debris disk. Astronomers think it's a spectrotype G yellow dwarf star with about 95% the mass of the Sun. The second brightest star in Sagittarius is Sigma Sagittarii, or Nunki. The name Nunki is Babylonian, however, its meanings are known. It's thought to represent the ancient Babylonian sacred city of Urdu on the Euphrates River. Now, if correct, that would make Nunki the oldest known star name in current use. Nunki is a spectral type B blue star, located about 260 light years away. 
It has about eight times the sun's mass, four and a half times its radius, and about 3,300 times the sun's luminosity. Alpha Sagittarii or rock bat, meaning the arch's knee, is a spectral type B blue star. Located some 182 light years away, it has some two and a half times the diameter of the sun and about 40 times the sun's luminosity. Astronomers think it's surrounded by a dense debris disk and a newborn companion star, which is only now about to join the main sequence. The Sagittarius constellation also hosts many star clusters and nebulae, including some of the best-known astronomical objects in the sky. These include the Lagoon Nebula, Messier 8, a spectacular pink emission nebula, located 5,000 light-years away and measuring some 140 light-years by 60 light-years across. The central region of the Lagoon Nebula is also known as the Hourglass Nebula because of its distinctive shape caused by matter propelled by a massive star-forming region called Herschel 36, one of the few star-forming nebulae that it's possible to see with the unaided eye. The Lagoon Nebula was instrumental in the discovery of Bok globules, more than 17,000 of which have been found in the nebula. Astronomers think Bok globules contain embryonic protostars destined to eventually become new stellar generations. Also located in this region of space is the stunning Messier 17, better known to pretty well everyone as the Horsehead Nebula. It's located some 4,890 light years away and is a dense region of ionized atomic hydrogen. Also known as the Omega or Swan Nebula, it spans some 15 light years across and has about 800 times the mass of the Sun. It's considered one of the brightest and most massive star forming regions in our galaxy, with a geometry similar to the Orion Nebula, except that it's being viewed edge on rather than face on. The open star cluster NGC 6618 lies embedded in the nebulosity, and its gases cause the nebula to shine due to the intense radiation from its hot young stars. Open star clusters are loosely bound groups of stars, usually containing a few hundred to thousands. They're thought to have originally all been formed in the same molecular gas and dust cloud, but they're not as densely bound together as globular clusters. Open star clusters generally survive for a few hundred million years, with the most massive ones maybe surviving for a few billion. Now, by contrast, the more massive globular clusters exert such a strong gravitational attraction on their members, they can survive for tens of billions of years or longer. The nebula is thought to contain up to 800 stars. More than a thousand additional stars are also being formed in the surrounding molecular gas and dust clouds. It's also one of the youngest known clusters, with an age of just a million years. The cloud of interstellar material which formed the nebula is roughly 40 light years in diameter, and it contains at least 30,000 solar masses. The Trifid Nebula, Messier 20, is another large star-forming emission nebula containing many young hot stars. Located between 2,000 and 9,000 light years away, the Trifid Nebula has a diameter of around 50 light years. The outside of the Trifid is a bluish reflection nebula, while the inner region glows pink thanks to ionized hydrogen. There are also two dark bands dividing the Trifid nebula into three regions or lobes. Hydrogen in the nebula is being ionized by a central triple star system, which formed at the intersection of the two dark bands, creating its characteristic pink color. Another star forming region in this part of the sky is NGC 6559 located some 5,000 light years away and containing both red emission and blue reflection regions. Now, the grouping of these three nebulae, the Lagoon Nebula, the Trifid Nebula and NGC 6559 is known as the Sagittarius Triplet. Another object worth looking out for is the Red Spider Nebula, NGC 6537. It's a planetary nebula about 8,000 light years away. It has a prominent two-lobed shape that could be due to a binary companion or simply magnetic fields, and it has a fascinating S-shaped symmetry, with the lobes opposite each other appearing similar. Again, this is believed to be due to the presence of a companion star to the central white dwarf. As for the central white dwarf, the remnant of the original star, it produces a powerful 10,000 degree hot, 3,000 km per second stellar wind which is generating 100 billion kilometer high waves from supersonic shocks formed as the local gas is being compressed and heated in front of the rapidly expanding lobes. 
Atoms caught up in these shocks are radiating invisible light, giving the nebula its unique spider-like shape and also contributing to the nebula's expansion. The star at the centre of the Red Spider Nebula is surrounded by a dust shell, making its exact properties hard to determine. Its surface temperature is probably somewhere around 250,000 degrees, although a temperature of up to half a million degrees can't be ruled out, which would make it among the hottest white dwarf stars known. Now, looking directly south right now, you'll see the star Polaris Australis, or more accurately, Sigma Octantis. It's the nearest star to the southern celestial pole, and consequently the counterpart to the northern star Polaris. However, Sigma Octantis is far harder to see than Polaris, because it's much fainter. Located some 270 light years away, it's an orange giant reaching the end of its life. Now, turning to the southwest and just above the horizon, you'll see the star Canopus. It's the second brightest star in the night sky after Sirius. Canopus is located some 310 light years away and is the brightest star in the constellation Carina the Keel. Canopus is a supergiant some nine times the mass of the Sun and 71 times its diameter. The month of June also marks the first of two annual encounters with the Torrid's meteor shower. The Torrids are generated as the Earth passes through the debris stream created by the comet 2P Enki, which itself could be part of a larger comet which broke apart about 20,000 to 30,000 years ago, most likely following numerous interactions with the powerful gravitational field of the planet Jupiter. As their name suggests, the Torrids' radiant, or apparent point of origin, is in the constellation Taurus the Bull. The Torrids meteor shower is made up of larger, more massive material, Think of pebbles instead of dust grains. Earth passes through this stream twice every year, once in June, then again in October, where it's called the Halloween fireballs. The Torrids releases material both by normal cometary activity and also occasionally by close encounters with the tidal gravitational force of the Earth and other planets. Now, all this combines to make the Torrid stream of material the largest in the inner solar system. And since the meteor stream is rather spread out in space, the Earth will take several weeks to pass through it, causing an extended period of meteor activity compared with the much smaller periods of activity for other meteor showers. Now included in the Torrid stream is a denser flow of gravelly meteoroids called the Torrid Swarm. It's thought to be a ribbon of rocks roughly 75 million kilometres wide by 150 kilometres across and held in orbit by Jupiter's gravity. Now, occasionally the Earth will pass through some of the larger meteoroids in the denser torrid swarm, and that can make things rather interesting on Earth. In fact, one of the larger chunks of the torrid swarm is now thought to have been the cause of the infamous Tunguska meteor event in the skies over Siberia on June the 30th, 1908. The Tunguska event is now believed to have been the airburst of a 100-metre-wide meteor over the Tunguska region of Russia, causing mass devastation and flattening more than 2,000 square kilometres of forest into matchsticks. In fact, the blast was so bright, it lit up the skies in London a third the way around the planet. Tunguska remains the largest known Earth impact event in recorded history. It was considered a one-in-a-thousand-year event, assuming a random distribution of events over time. But new studies suggest the event may have been caused by a torrid swarm meteor. And with Earth passing through the swarm periodically, it changes the odds significantly. Now, if this study is correct, the swarm heightens the possibility of a cluster of large impacts on Earth over a relatively short period of time. Further complicating matters, the June torrids are actually seen as two separate showers. The southern torrids are the ones associated with the comet 2P Enki, while the northern torrids originate from the asteroid 2004 TG10, an eccentric kilometre-wide asteroid classified as a near-Earth object and a potentially hazardous asteroid of the Apollo group. Jonathan Nally is the editor of Australian Sky and Telescope magazine, and he joins us now to continue our tour of the June night skies on Skywatch. G'day, Stuart. So, yeah, let's take a look at the night sky for June. So for us in the Southern Hemisphere, which is where I live, we're heading, heading into winter. Well, we're in winter now. So for this is an interesting thing, actually, about, about the season. So in Australia here, we consider winter to be just three calendar months, June, July, August, whereas in some other parts of the world, their, their season will start exactly on the solstice day. That's 
beginning of their um, their season, whether it's summer or yeah, winter. Yeah, that's most countries, isn't it, do that? We're, we're unusual. We're, this is a British sort of thing, isn't it? It's an unusual sort of thing. But look, most, most seasons sort of um, don't really correspond with the season anyway. <laughs> um, I mean, talking about winter and summer to someone who lives in the tropics. Um, yeah, I used to live in Darwin it, it, and we have yeah, wet, wet build up and dry. dry. That's it. Just those three. That's right. So anyway, um, wintertime basically here in the Southern Hemisphere where I am in summertime up north. Summertime, of course, is great for viewing because you go out and do some stargazing and it's nice and warm and the weather's usually good. Wintertime, it's colder. But the one advantage you get with wintertime is that the nights are longer. So you do have more time of darkness to go out and do some stargazing. So if it's, it's cloudy at 7 o'clock at night, you know, leave it till 9 and the clouds might have cleared up. Mm. So um, that is the one advantage of doing some stargazing during winter. But also, of course, you can see lots of good things. So um, in June... If you go outside and have a look, you'll see our galaxy seen from the inside, which is the Milky Way, stretching all across the sky from the east to west. That's in the sort of early part of the evening after it's got dark. For us down here in the south, you'll be able to see the Southern Cross about two-thirds of the way up from the southern horizon, standing upright. It looks a bit like a kite. Pretty easy to see. Just these four stars are reasonably bright, too. It's a very small constellation, so people go out and they think it might be a huge thing, but it's actually the smallest constellation there is. So don't look for something that's you know, really giant. It's really compact, like a little little kite flying in the sky. Over in the west, about to disappear for the, for the rest of the season, is the um, brightest star in the night sky, Sirius. In the, in the constellation Canis Major, and around, further around to its left or the southwest is the second brightest star in the sky called Canopus. That's in the constellation called Carina. If you're in a dark location and you're down here in the south, you've got clear skies and an unobstructed view of the southern horizon, have a look and see if you can spot these two Magellanic clouds we're always going on about. This is a good time to see them. They're very faint. They just look like little faint, fuzzy clouds, but they are actually fairly sizable galaxies. These are named after the uh, explorer Ferdinand Magellan, who spotted them as he was sailing around the world. You need to have dark skies. You can't can't see them if you're standing under a street light or something. So you just go somewhere dark and let your eyes adapt to the darkness so that you can see faint things. And look down the south and see if you can see these couple of smudges. You've got the large one and the small one. They're a little distance apart. But uh, once you spot them, you'll always be able to spot them. Then once you re- recognize what they look like, then every time you go out and you've got some dark skies, you should be able to see them if they're, if they're up at that time of the year. Now look at uh, the northern half of the sky. For us down the south this time of the year, the northern half of the sky seems a bit bare. A lot of the good stuff that can be seen in the northern hemisphere we can't see from down here but we can see the bright star Arcturus which is about halfway up from the northern horizon. Overhead, roughly from the uh, latitude of Sydney and cities of that latitude, uh, you can see another bright star called Spica. Now Arcturus is a red giant star that's a couple of billion years older than our sun, about two and a half billion years older than our sun. It's the same mass as our sun but it's older and it's ballooned up to be about 25 times bigger than our sun. And so it's become absolutely huge compared to a good old Sol. The other star I mentioned, Spica, that's interesting too. It's a binary star system whose two stars, the pair of stars, orbit so close to each other, only takes four days for them to orbit around each other, that their, their mutual gravitational pull is so strong because they're so close. That each of them has been stretched into an egg shape rather than being a round star. So imagine that, an enormous one of them is big, one of them is small, an enormous star. No, I'm, talk- I'm talking actually about egg-shaped, not just a flattened sphere. I'm actually talking egg-shaped. So, so one side of it is, is pulled out, pointing in, in the direction of the other star, and the other star is pointing in the direction of that star. So, uh, so the um, gravitational attraction is really it, strong. The gravitational attraction is very because they're so close to each other. They orbit around each other every four days, can you believe? Imagine a huge star doing that. So, yeah, really interesting when you go out and look at some of these stars, when you know what you're looking at, when you do a bit of investigation and work out what scientists found, they take on a bit more interest, I think, than just these little lots of light in the sky. Okay, so that's what you see in the throughout the evening, the between sunset and, and midnight. Uh, as the night goes on, though, you'll see that things change, and that's because the Earth is spinning on its axis. So different stars are coming up in the east, and other stars are going down the west. So by midnight, Sirius is gone in the west. And you've got the bright stars Vega and Altair have appeared in the north, pretty low down, far in the north for people in the southern hemisphere, but they're still good to look at. Way down south, we've got another bright star called Akonar. That's um, that one, Akonar, and the sort of Southern Cross and Canopus, they form this big triangle in the sky. So it's pretty easy to spot Akonar. And the Milky Way, which was stretching east to west across the sky in the early evening, is now stretching north to south. So it hasn't moved. It's the Earth that's turning on its axis that's moving. 
and our viewpoint is therefore changing. So let's look at the planets. So we'll start with Mercury, the innermost planet. First half of June, forget it, it's lost in the twilight, the, the glare of the sun in the west and the sun's going down. But in the second half of June, it'll pop up on the other side of the sky over the eastern horizon just before sunrise and should be fairly easy to spot if you have a clear view of the horizon. Mercury just looks like a star, doesn't look like much even if you get a telescope onto it. Uh, if you get a big telescope onto it, it looks a bit like the moon. But I wouldn't go pointing a telescope anywhere near the eastern horizon when the sun's about to come up just in case you blind yourself, so please don't do that. The other inner planet, Venus, well, that's pretty easy to see, actually, and that is above the western horizon just after sunset. So when the sun goes down, look out the west, see a big, bright star-looking thing. That'll be Venus. And as each day goes by throughout the month, you'll see it climbing higher and higher in the sky. Just each day, it's just getting a little bit higher, a little bit higher, a little bit higher. On the 12th, if you've got a clear sky on the 12th, go out and you'll see a really, really thin crescent moon just to Venus' bright. So that should look pretty specky. You've got this bright star-looking thing, Venus, and uh, this really, really slender, thin crescent moon. So that looks, should look nice. By the end of the month, if you keep an eye on Venus and watch it moving on, on the sky as it gets higher and higher, you'll see it drawing closer to a reddish-looking star that's a bit higher up in the sky. Well, that's not a star. That's actually the planet Mars. So they're going to be reasonably close together. I mean, not exactly side by side, but in the same part of the sky. Mars, of course, it, got a whole flotilla of spacecraft on it at present, either circling in orbit above or, or down Crawling the Crawling over the surface, but, yeah. Yeah, that, that's another thing I like to think of when I look at these planets. I think, oh, there's a spacecraft there doing this and that, and then humankind sent these little machines all the way there, and they're working, and they're sending back pictures, and it's just absolutely marvellous. Now, if you have a pair of binoculars, take a look on June 24th and 25th, or if you've got a, what they call a small wide field telescope, which gives you a wide view, you can use that as well, but a pair of binoculars will do. Have a look at Mars on June 24th and 25th, and you'll see behind Mars in the distance, well, it's, it's, a, it's light years in the distance, there's a star cluster. So Mars is going to go right in front of this star cluster. It's called the Beehive Cluster, or Messier 44, and it should be an absolutely wonderful sight to see this red planet with these beautiful sparkly stars behind it. It, it really should look nice. So if you get a chance, June 24th, 25th. Now, if you want to see Jupiter and Saturn, you're going to have to stay up a bit later. Saturn comes up over the eastern horizon about 9.45 p.m., beginning of June, with Jupiter about, about an hour and a quarter later. If you have a look on June the 28th, you'll see the moon right next to Saturn. And the following night, the moon will have moved and it will be right next to Jupiter. Now, this is a really easy way, actually, to identify planets if you don't know which, which planet's out there. If you know coming up that the moon, as it trundles around its orbit and shifts from night to night, if you know that the moon's going to be next to one of these planets or near to one of these planets, you can go out on that night and think, and say, okay, there's the moon, so the nearest bright thing to the moon must be Jupiter or Saturn or whatever. So I'll just give those dates again. June 28th, go out and have a look for the moon, and the brightest thing near the moon will be Saturn. And the next night, June 29th, the brightest thing near the moon will be Jupiter. You actually really can't miss Jupiter because it is really, really bright. Uh, what else have we got? Well, we've only got one more thing to, to talk about for this month, and that is that this month, June 21st, we reach the solstice, of course. The winter solstice that's, for uh, us in the southern hemisphere. The that's north, right, and the summer, summer solstice, solstice for those in the north. north. That's right. So on this day, the hours of darkness are longest in the southern half of the planet, and the hours of daylight are longest in the northern half of the planet. So summer up there, get down here. That's Jonathan Nally the editor of Sky and Telescope magazine. And don't forget, if you're having trouble getting your copy of Australian Sky and Telescope magazine from your usual retailer because of the current lockdown and travel restrictions, you can always get a print or digital subscription and have the magazine delivered directly to your letterbox or inbox. Subscribing's easy. Just go to skyandtelescope.com.au. That's skyandtelescope.com.au and you'll never be left in the dark again. That's the show for now. Space Time is available every Monday, Wednesday and Friday through Apple Podcasts, iTunes, Stitcher, Google Podcasts, Pocket Casts, Spotify, Acast, Amazon Music, Bytes.com, SoundCloud, YouTube, your favourite podcast download provider and from spacetimewithstuartgary.com. Space Time's also broadcast through the National Science Foundation on Science Zone Radio and on both iHeartRadio and TuneIn Radio. And you can help to support our show by visiting the Spacetime store for a range of promotional merchandising goodies. Or by becoming a Spacetime patron, which gives you access to triple episode commercial free versions of the show, as well as lots of bonus audio content which doesn't go to air, access to our exclusive Facebook group and other rewards. 
Just go to spacetimewithstuartgary.com for full details. And if you want more Space Time, please check out our blog, where you'll find all the stuff we couldn't fit in the show, as well as heaps of images, news stories, loads of videos, and things on the web I find interesting or amusing. Just go to spacetimewithstuartgary.tumblr.com. That's all one word, and that's Tumblr without the E. You can also follow us through at Stuart Gary on Twitter, at Space Time with Stuart Gary on Instagram, through our Space Time YouTube channel. And on Facebook, just go to facebook.com forward slash Space Time with Stuart Gary. And Space Time is brought to you in collaboration with Australian Sky and Telescope magazine, your window on the universe. You've been listening to Space Time with Stuart Gary. This has been another quality podcast production from Bytes.com. 